I was in one of the kitchens and just because the at lunchtime, there's a lot of people at the same time having lunch, at least when we used to be in the office. And I was watching one of the runners hand washing dishes because the dishwashers were already full and running. And you know what I mean? They were trying to keep up with the demand for forks or something like that. But I was just standing there watching and I'm like, I don't think she came here to wash forks. My guest today is Andrew Schlussel, who is currently the Director of Global Talent Development at Framestore and an online class instructor at the Academy of Art University. Before that, he was an instructor at Pixar Animation Studios, Global Head of Training and Development at MPC and Education Manager at DreamWorks Animation. Together we talk about how he is moving the world of education in visual effects, the importance of education being part of the company culture, and how you can implement successful learning for yourself and in your team. You are listening to The 21 Artist Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content to pursue their passion. I'm talking with creators, artists and engineers about their careers, lessons they have learned and how to make an impact. I'm your host, Alexander Richter. I'm a technical director and coach in visual effects, animation, and games. For more content, go to 21artistshow.com. Enjoy the show. I'm super excited to welcome you to the show, Andrew. We have some interesting topics regarding education and learning for today and a lot of ground to cover. Why not start with a short introduction to give us a little bit of an insight into your career and where you are now? What does exactly the Director of Global Talent Development actually do? At Framestore, my job is to create an environment where every employee is feeling like they are developing and moving forward in their craft and their career. So this is providing inspirational uh, events. This is online training. This is in-person training artistic development, anything that's going to help people learn and move forward in their career. So it's creating a rich learning environment in the workplace. How did you came up to this position? Because I mean, I gave you, I give a little bit of introduction throughout your career and it's always about education, about development of education. So can you give us like a, like a brief uh, history of how did you start? Like, how did you even get into this, this educational field as, as an instructor, as a developer? And then how it become that you became uh, like the talent developer in, at Framestore, basically? Yeah, well, when I got into 3D animation, you know, it was coming out of film school. I went to New York University Film School. And at that time in the 90s, it was a pretty kind of esoteric niche knowledge to know 3D animation. Uh, not that many people were doing it. The, the equipment and the software wasn't that easily accessible like it is today. So um, I moved to San Francisco and uh, I kind of wandered into this school, Academy of Art University, and say, hey, can I teach here? This was after I graduated NYU. And I got my first teaching job there. And it was sort of, I got into education by mistake in a way, because I sort of imagined myself, you know, a film director or something like that. But you know, I found myself in education and worked there for years. I worked at another school in Emeryville, California, uh, called Expression College for Digital Arts. And I also um, eventually got work at Pixar, where I was teaching Maya over there. And that was such a great inspirational experience. This is way back in like 2003, 2004. And I had a mentor at Pixar, a guy named Randy Nelson, he was the one who started what they called Pixar University. And Pixar University was sort of the school within the company. And they had a really ambitious program when Pixar started because it, uh, you know, there was no such thing as a 3D animator then. Like it wasn't a career, it wasn't an education you can get. So everybody got this whole training program. And so, and then uh, that led to my role at DreamWorks where I was an education manager there, involved with the training there, and that kind of continued sort of my education about what it's like to teach and create an educational environment inside a studio. Uh, and then that led eventually to MPC, uh, where, as you mentioned, I was global head of training and development and uh, heading something called MPC Academy, which is a, a training program for new hires, essentially, uh, which eventually then led to Framestore. 
I think uh, I've read about the uh, MPC. Is, is it something where you uh, literally can apply from outside? Is, if I remember correctly, where you can say like, oh, I go through the academy and then there is like a, a certainty or maybe security that you will get hired if you successfully finish that academy. The goal of MPC Academy was to fill the gap between where people were when they graduate and where they need to be to work in production. So there's a lot of great schools out there. They're doing really good work but you just can't quite create a studio environment in a school There's for a variety of reasons. You don't have the client content. You don't have the, you know, the in-house tools. There's a lot of reasons. And so we created this 12-week program where the students would learn inside the studio. They would be paid full time. And at the end of which, if they were successful, they were offered a, a, a contract, like a full-time contract. So it was a paid employment, but they were learning full time. And I believe they've still continued this, but now under the umbrella of Technicolor Academy. Yeah, I, I remember I saw that when I was kind of also looking for internship, looking to kind of my way into the industry. And I saw that and I thought it was like, it, lo it looked like a really, really cool idea because it's basically what you have uh, in other industries, generally speaking, you know, that that's something that you kind of miss in VFX and animation is like, normally you go maybe through junior, maybe through the internship, but there's, there's rarely something that you like uh, trained in the company per se as really as a trainee, more or less a little bit from zero zero kind of situation and i think that's that's something missing in our industry because it makes it closes it up very much because you already have to have a specific set of skill and quality a lot of times to even like get a chance like you know for example i was a part of the launchpad internship at framestore uh, like 2016 and um, it was already kind of you had to prove that you were already kind of on a on a junior level actually in a way and it was a super cool experience but I, w I was imagining like when I was like studying media computer science where we had a little bit of 3D I was never even close on that level you know I would not I would never be able to kind of apply and get picked because it is still kind of like uh, I don't know 300 100 people who apply and then uh, they're picked like 10 or something, which is cool. And it was a really cool experience. But I feel like this is when I saw that, for example, for MPC, and I didn't know that, actually, I didn't know that you were involved in that. Yeah, well, I, I was hired to head that, you know, back in 2014. Um, and so suddenly I'm in charge of this international project and this international team. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a good time. I, I enjoyed it and I learned a lot. And I think, you know, we trained a lot of visual effects artists that are still working to this day that may have not otherwise gotten into the industry. Um, and some of them would have and some of them wouldn't have. But, um, the, you know, at Framestore, you mentioned the Launchpad uh, internship, which is a summer internship. And, and yes, that's for currently enrolled students who are already showing, you know, a lot of knowledge and skill in visual effects. But we have other entry paths. So for example, we have the apprenticeship, which is a UK specific thing. And uh, there they spend 80% of their time in the studio, 20% of their time uh, in full-time learning. And um, so that's another entry path. And that's for people who haven't even been through university actually. So it's an entry path you know, for people who either couldn't or didn't want to go to university, but still have a passion for this. And then beyond that, we still have our runner pool, which, you know, it's, it's somewhat controversial, but um, I actually like it because sometimes it just fits the right person and their work as a runner and they get in there and they learn and they work really hard and they work their, in that way, they work their way into the business that way. So there are other entry paths um, besides just coming as a junior. So, and, and then, you know, Launchpad Internship, we, we hire over 70% of those people end up working at Framestore. So it's pretty good. I mean, that was actually, actually also my experience when, when I was there is like, um, it was, uh, for, for me personally, it was a fantastic experience. I was not expecting any of the quality, time investment, and basically planliness through all this whole thing. So we had, um, we had planned like um, sessions with people from like leads and supervisor who were explaining each of the departments. We had our own kind of like owner supervisor who was kind of supervising. By the way, Eugenie von Tutzelmann, who was actually on a previous episode, she was my supervisor. Um, and um, yeah, and it was it was we get pay, paid. 
Um, it was actually, we, we got a flat. So it was for me personally, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, I, I was not expecting uh, that level of commitment from the company. And I, I had a feeling actually that when I graduated, I definitely would have a job or probably would have a job there. And I know that at least like half of the people uh, did uh, get, get a job uh, and a pretty maybe probably all of them could have, you know. So I, I think it is it is a fantastic, fantastic idea. Um, and of course, I also, for example, you mentioned that like the runner system, that's very unusual for me because I'm, I'm more familiar with the like German system. And in Germany, we have this internship is very strong, but internship is a little bit like runner mixed with junior. So it is like bringing coffee uh, and sometimes it is done also still working already in a beginner stage. So it's a more of a mix, but it's more typical, I would say. So I was a little bit kind of. Uh, surprised by this environment because I, I was not familiar. But I think that's mainly in London, the runner system. Or do you know? Oh no, we have somewhere? we have runners in Montreal. Um, oh really? I think we have okay. them in the other studios as well. Um, and I think you know, I, I think it, it. I think I mentioned it's controversial because I think some companies do it well and some companies don't. You know, you know, if someone's just you know getting coffee and cleaning and never has an opportunity to learn. Well, you know, it just yes. it feels exploitive, you know, but if if you're giving them a foot in the door, exposing them to the environment and then sort of essentially giving them the keys to the castle, you know what I mean? We, you know, we make a point of providing learning opportunities to our runners, trying to connect them with help. You know, they have to be somewhat of a self-starter, too, because unlike the internship, runners aren't paid to learn. So they have to be very self-motivated and learn on their own time. Yeah, I think that's that's also the the main idea. I think in education, probably everywhere, but in education too, is like how you frame it. You know, like you can you can have as you as you mentioned, like a running a runner system where you basically exploit people, and then they just come there, and you need just like low paid uh, like workers who do all the chores basically. Or you 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 have people that is kind of like okay, we, we cannot hire you as a junior or something. You basically have zero skills. So we, we create this entry level for you, which means zero skill entry level. We give you the environment so you are surrounded by all the people. And that's something I, I at least picked up is kind of like creating the chance, yeah. like to, to speak to the people. And I mean, I think the biggest difference for me personally, if the company at least creates the opportunities, like real one, like not just like, oh, you just talk to people, but like give it a little bit like, oh, I don't know, you get like some hours a week of training or time for training or something i think that's important because for me personally when i when i experienced that i was kind of i was on the fence on it i was like on the one side i, I like this kind of openness but on the other side also a little bit like independent of the companies i feel like um you should go into something like that with a little bit more of preparation you know like why not spend already your time with the internet already uh, prepare yourself on a on a specific level, you know, like a year, two, or three, and then try to do an internship or whatever. Oh, you yeah. know. So I'm also like on the runner side. I'm sometimes it's like maybe it also makes sense to to make a little bit of a of a bar barrier to 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 really pick people who who will invest effort and time and not just like I don't know nothing. I'm finished with school. Let's see uh, if if I will learn something if I go for this runner program or something. So I'm I'm kind of like on the fence from both side, the company side, to kind of maybe misuse it, but also sometimes on the on the student and runner side to kind of like do this. I don't know what to do next, so I will try to do that kind of thing. At Framestore, we have visual effects supervisors that started as runners, you know, many many years ago. You know, our global. Uh, had a global managing director of film, Fiona Walkinshaw, started as a receptionist. So, I mean, we do have quite a long history of people starting in these roles and really moving up through the ranks. And uh, yeah, one thing, one thing I did with the runner, well, I'll tell you a quick story. So I was, I was in one of the kitchens and just because the, at lunchtime, there's a lot of people at the same time having lunch, at least when we used to be in the office. And I was watching one of the runners hand washing dishes because the dishwashers were already full and running and you know what I mean? They were trying to keep up with the demand for forks or something like that. And I was just standing there watching and I'm like, I don't think she came here to wash forks. You know what I mean? And so what I started was a weekly uh, session, a weekly meeting with the runners. And what I did was I invited, first I invited everybody in the company who themselves started as a runner. 
And this was at all different levels, including visual effects supervisors, but people at all different levels of the company to come in once a week, we'd have a speaker, we'd gather the runners together, and they'd just give a talk and offer advice and offer encouragement and just kind of make those connections. And I thought, I thought that was a good thing. And then I would just sort of check in with each of the runners and be like, what's happening with you? You know, are you, are you learning? How, what, what are you focusing on? Where do you want to go? And so we, uh, you know, just trying to, 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 to knit those things together, to stitch those things together so that they weren't kind of isolated and just washing forks, basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's 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 the thing that that you you also see as as an artist. I mean that's that's the thing. I I I cannot see what's behind the scenes. How they I can I I for example see runners when they when they do the chores. You know that's the that's my experience. But I mean uh, what be interesting for me is before we dive a little bit deeper into like your your progress at the moment and stuff like that. I think for me would be interesting. You you mentioned like your history and how you kind of went through all the departments and um. My my interest would be a little bit of how did it happen? So what was the the like the point of of you like switching your I idea and your motivation from actually like developing something to like like being creative or whatever to to channel this energy in education and development of learning and stuff like that? Because it is not not usually something that you people are aspire to at least not when they like you know like you want to become the producer the director the artist you rarely want to become the teacher well i think you know i started to say i think it happened it started by mistake or by accident you know i just i, I mentioned kind of you know i moved to san francisco no idea where i was going to work dreams of being a director or animated film director or working at pixar or something like that and this is, you know, this is 97, so it's still at the kind of earlier days of things like, you know, computer animation and, and computer visual effects. And, um, and yeah, I just started, I needed a job. And so I just started teaching and, and, and stuck with it. And I think what I found in myself, and this is what I believe is the definition of a real educator as a real teacher, is someone who gets joy and satisfaction from seeing other people succeed. And I think that whatever field you're in, if that's where you get your joy and satisfaction, then an educator is a sensible role for you. I think the other part of it is I'm just constantly and insatiably curious. So I think in the industry, especially in a big company like a frame store, or, you know, these kinds of companies, you really need to focus. You really need to have a pretty narrow focus and become very, very good at kind of one thing or one small set of things. And I've just been constantly curious. You know, I've, I, you know, I was a cinematographer on a feature film. I've done loads of video editing. I've done graphic design. I've made websites. I've done modeling, texturing, rigging, animation, like I've done every single part of the process and I, I like doing it, but I'm also a little bit like, ooh, shiny new toy. Okay, <laughs> next shiny new toy. Okay, like I'm a little bit like that where I just, I constantly want to learn the next thing and the new thing. And, and so I think that being in education gives me the opportunity to just constantly be learning new things and just kind of feed that insatiable curiosity. I think good educators are first really good learners. They're people who love to learn and are just always learning and are always teaching themselves. And then they can kind of boil that down and deliver it back to other people. So, and it's that, and to me, the greatest success, like when I worked in colleges and universities, what my success was my student success. So the ultimate success of a teacher is seeing your student surpass your ability. So I would teach a student and they would learn from me and then they would continue to learn from their, on their own and then they would surpass me. They'd become better at whatever I was teaching. And for some people, that hurts. They kind of, they're, they're, protect, they're like, oh, I helped this person and now they're my competition. They're better than me. But I never saw it that way because to me, that's the ultimate sign of success. And I would take that one step further which is in the teachers who, because I was often heading the department, and the teachers who worked for me, when I saw them promoted and have their own department and become my contemporary, same thing. I saw that as the ultimate success. The guy, the, the guy who worked for me is now my equal. That's success for me. So I, I see people and myself who get joy from seeing others succeed are educators, and that's what feeds me. 
that's the thing and i think that you're you're totally right i'm i'm also doing like master classes i'm doing coaching and it came like naturally you know while i was trying to kind of achieve my own career i kind of noticed this this enjoyment of like teaching even like for example for me it was always because i'm a technical director um it was the joy of teaching artists to understand actually something i don't like to like you know like if you do coding or if you tech, have technical problems i actually don't like to just fix it or throw them code at them and then they're like uh, whatever I really like to kind of like explain to them for example oh it crashed because or or uh, this is the workaround for the future and sometimes I did a documentation for that like literally kind of I, w I enjoyed more teaching them uh, permanently instead of like um, creating a position for me where the need is there you know kind of this yeah 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 like uh, I fix it and then next time you have to call me again because then like you know I feel important or something I, I never had this I, I was I was always kind of rather I will teach you once and then if you replace me then I'm just not good enough you know like if you if I can teach you and you at the end replace me then I'm not learning enough or I'm not good enough and that's that means like okay I'm just stagnating and and the only way of of keeping it is by keeping everyone else down more or less you know so I was I was always kind of on this impression that 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 this is something um that you should like every master should teach in some capacity i don't think you have to be like a teacher teacher but i think in a way that like teaching like even as a lead or whatever supervisor i think you should have like like an element of teaching in there where you teach your staff and kind of give them a little bit not just like manage but also teach a little bit so so they can grow under you and basically best case they will make your life easier i mean that's the that's the the trade-off a little bit yeah i mean my tag my tagline for the you know the training department at frame store is that everyone is a student and everyone is a teacher the idea is that everybody has something to share and teach and everybody has something to learn doesn't matter if you've been in the industry 20 years and you're a super senior visual effects supervisor there's still new things to learn and even if you're new to the industry, you still may have things to offer and teach. So that's the point of view because, you know, we have limited resources. I think Framestore supports training and education really well considering, but, you know, there's limited bandwidth, there's limited time, there's limited money, and we can leverage the amazing expertise and talent within the company. So the more we seize themselves as a teacher, the more of an enriched learning environment we can create for everybody. My question would be, I mean, for through all the things that you were talking and again I, I really I think one of the things that I really really like about is to create like an entrance into the industry I think that's that's really cool but of course also like keeping things going while people people working because I mean there is there is this stigma or like this cliche that basically everyone is like watching tutorials all the time you know like at work probably and also then they go home and then they start to watch tutorials again I'm again the longer I'm doing this the less I'm 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 into that situation I don't think that is healthy because at, at the end of the day you get obsessed and then kind of lose a little bit of balance in life so so that's why I really like the um, the element of having education during work and in the company so like it would be interesting from from you said because you are working on 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 this kind of directions um what is what is something that you think would enhance like the learning and working experience and maybe also like if you have a programs at the moment doing like how does it look like you know can you give us a little bit of that that would be interesting for me there's there's a little bit of a pre-covid post-covid thing here so i'm going to first talk about pre-covid and my favorite training and educational events are the ones where I got people out from behind their computers. So every Monday we had figure drawing. We had a nude figure model come in and people could draw. Um, we also had a figure sculpting class. So this was a series and you had the metal armature and just the clay, you know, just basic water-based clay. And again, a nude figure model and a really great teacher, this woman, Livia Turco, did most of them. And yeah, just slapping clay on this thing and, and studying anatomy and touching clay and being in the physical world. I think that, you know, you mentioned people doing tutorials all day and all night. And yes, we're all continuous learners. And I think that's value and important. But what are visual effects artists mostly trying to do? They're trying to recreate the real world on the screen. But if all you ever do is look at a screen, 
you're not really studying the real world. Yeah. So, uh, you know, between drawing, sculpting, we had a, a, a sketching group. We'd go out and sketch architecture in the neighborhood. I brought in speakers like uh, to talk about puppetry, for example, or many times we'd bring in an animal anatomy and motion experts such as Stuart Sumida um, to talk to and do presentations on the creatures we're currently working on. Or I remember I, we, we had someone come in um, and talk about cloth and fabric for our, our creature effects team that does all the, the clothing simulation. And she showed, she brought a suitcase full of all kinds of different cloth and showed how they were moved and discussed how clothes was made and how that impacted the way they move and had everybody touching the cloth and kind of wearing it and running around the room and stuff. So it's those kinds of things that I get most excited about and really feel most proud of is when we do things where we get them off their computers and, and learning. And that doesn't mean we don't do loads of on computer learning. Of course, we do loads of that stuff. In fact, the, the training room that I set up there is all about, you know, a million monitors everywhere and set up, you know, perfectly for um, a computer learning environment. But uh, it's, it's those things. And as much as possible, I like to do it during the workday. Sometimes we do it after hours, but when I can do it during the workday, I do. So how did it change? Now, from before to yet now, basically, at least for, for until the end of the year, we don't know how it will be next year, but... Since COVID, obviously, all that live and in-person stuff went away. And, you know, uh, over, you know, we, we had just, everybody had just gotten home and, you know, I was in the weekend and kind of, I often have my best ideas, I think, like on the weekend when I'm like daydreaming and those kinds of things. And I was like, we really need something to keep us connected and inspired and informed while we're all living separately and working separately. And so I pitched this idea uh, to uh, my boss, William Sargent, and I said, uh, and my original name for it was Radio Free Frame Store. And that was a, a reference to what was called Radio Free Europe, which where they set up big radio towers um, on, the, uh, on the western side of the Iron Curtain so that the Eastern Bloc countries could get information about what was going on in the outside world because they're, <laughs> so the metaphor was we're kind of all locked away and, and then Radio Free Frame Store was keeping you informed. But like, you know, nobody knew what that was. <laughs> like nobody had, like well, the, the company is all 30 year olds. They've never heard it, you know, they've never even heard of that. <laughs> it was too obscure a reference. So thankfully someone else come up with a much better title for it, which we just call it FTV, as in Frame Store Television. And FTV uh, is a weekly set of programming of webinars and talks and training and classes Most of them produced internally, but I also linked to external ones that were going on as well that were offered because there's so much of that stuff was offered free. So I sort of curated it and had a, a Monday newsletter. We're still doing it now more than a year later. Every Monday, there's usually some like in the early days, we had sometimes four or even five events in a week. Now it's usually like one or two a week. And uh, we record them all. We put them on a website. We also created a gallery page for people to submit the artwork, their personal artwork they've done at home. And the topics ranged from, you know, very specific stuff that was going on to the company to purely inspirational random things. I just a couple weeks ago, I had my friend Kevin Kane on, who has done a lot in kind of laser scanning, LIDAR, those, you know, uh, photogrammetry, that whole world. And he's using machine learning and, uh, uh, you know, deep, deep learning and AI and all that to reconstruct uh, 3D geometry from scan data um, and putting that towards things like uh, antiquities. So that's not something we're working on at the moment, but it's just inspirational. Or we'll have a new thing at the company. Uh, Framestore has something called Fuse, which is Framestore Unreal Shot Engine, which is our effort to have Unreal become part of the visual effects pipeline. And so, in fact, Yesterday, we had an FTV show um, showing the features of Unreal Engine 5. So it's everything from things people can apply directly to the work to things that are purely inspirational. Or we even have a film club or a group just talks about films they've watched. So it's keeping people, it's keeping people inspired, informed, and connected while we're all separate. And what's, what's nice is, I think even if we're all back in the office full time, this will carry on because it's actually really helped unite Framestore internationally. There was a way in which like sort of stuff that's happening in the London stuff, you know, LA would not really 
get much benefit of. But with this, you know, everybody's on an equal playing field. So yes, we lost the in-person stuff, but I actually think we gained more international connectedness. Yeah, and and I always uh, thought that the Germans are the only one who do like Second World War references here, but but um, maybe you should call it IIS, uh, IIC for inspiration, information, and connection. That that could be an idea. Um, no, but I really really think um, there is more to to like education and learning than just like watching videos, for example. And I think that's something that you kind of um, also like integrate basically because at the end of the day is like you know if you can you can um give your your employees and artists you can give like all the educational access maybe you know there's a lot of thing fh phd fx phd uh pluralside and so and so on that's great but i mean again they're sitting at the computer they're they're watching more of what they already know partially or like specific things and it's kind of like what you what you mentioned is like you get your best uh, ideas on the weekends and that's something that i notice a lot of times every time i'm working on something and the more um i'm getting challenged or the more i'm kind of like I have to find a system, a template, something like where I have like more as a structural thing, you know, it's not like just like like a nut to crack, basically. The more I need a pause, actually, the more I need this shower ideas, the just five minutes before you go to sleep ideas, the you are on a hike somewhere. And then like you, you the most important thing now is to find some phone or piece of paper to write that down that you just kind of uh, popped into your head. So I feel like um, that's one of the things I personally enjoy the most is actually um, like set work or something similar because it kind of gets me away from the computer. It it gives me like a haptic thing where I can touch things, which is like, feels like like my sensors of touch are, are gone basically. And also it feels like that, like you said, it's inspired and form and connect. It's actually that's that I sometimes miss if I'm standing in front of computer uh, all day. And if I'm watching tutorials for myself, there's all this missing. So I think this, is, this sounds uh, really, really fantastic. And that you kind of, um, integrate that uh, as uh, as part of that even if it's now harder you know like with with all this separation through computers we're again back on the screen um it's still a little bit better to at least learn together than you know, like send someone a, a page to watch it uh, later kind of yeah it's there's something interesting that i've noticed too is the um so we record all of these events and webinars of course and post them but there's still st even though it's not necessarily logical, there's still something to being there when it's happening live that just changes the dynamic. Like people, they they want to go to the live thing and if if they, yeah, people will watch the recording, but it's just somehow less engaging if it's not happening right now. And I think some of it's psychological, but I think there's something more to it. I mean, sure, you can actually ask questions and have it answered. And obviously that's part of it. And being a, there's a sense of being a participant that I think is so important. That's not just a consumer of stuff. Because as soon as it's not live, you could watch 50 million different things. You know what I mean? You've got, you know, you've got, like you're saying, all these tutorial things that you have access to. In fact, Framestore uh, provides everybody with a whole range of different options for online tutorials, both internally created and externally. And then you have a million forms of entertainment. Everybody's got their Netflix and their Amazon. Their so it's like, do I wanna watch this thing that was recorded at work or do I want to watch any number of a million things? Whereas if it's live, you're kind of there. And I think, I don't know, I really think there's something to that. I don't, I don't think I quite have it clear in my head, but it matters. Yeah, there was this, this tweet I feel I remember is like people nowadays uh, will not understand the the rush of running to the toilet, getting some snack, and running back to the couch. Uh, is like uh, it, that's something. Or or I mean, if you if you think about it, I don't know why it is that way. Uh, it's uh, like Netflix and all this uh, on demand. It kind of the diminishes the value of something like a, a movie so if i remember like 2015 i'm not sure if it's if it's in england the same always at 20 like 8 8 8 15 p.m there was always movie time it always like blockbuster especially on fridays or weekends like Jurassic park star wars whatever and and it was always super kind of exciting because you had like a specific time frame you maybe it was a preparation in early it was it was not picked by you so it was kind of like you have to accept what is coming and then maybe 
pick what what is something and i think it creates a different like association and value a little bit you know so for example something i, I recently learned is um if you pay you pay attention and i think in a way this if you pay with your time and like being on schedule and stuff like that for a live event even if it's online you pay more attention than something that you can basically stop and watch during something else and stuff like that so i think this Paying attention is always connected to paying from your side. Paying can be money, but it can be also kind of effort and whatever. So I feel like um, we have to create an environment where we have to pay um, you know, in, in some way so we value what we get. You know, because because else like, you know, like how many YouTube videos I watched and literally didn't learn anything because either I paid half attention, they were bad or something something in the middle huh, kind of situation you know and so it, it is it is the thing is basically this this live event or um getting people from the computer i feel that creates this paying attention much more than um than just kind of providing information and books and uh, videos and stuff like that so i think it should be and must be part of like any personal or company-wide education system not just to provide but to create like an in system to really make sure that it it uh, again, I, I love your 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 free words: inspire, inform, and connect. You know, I think that's super important. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, and I think, you know, it's like I'm sure we've all. I know. I mean, I've hosted over a hundred of these webinars, um, and but I've also attended a lot of things, and I know a lot of the times I'm on there and someone's messaging me and I'm over here for like doing that or oh catching up on an email or something I need to you know like you might when you're on the, the other side of the camera you might imagine people are in like rapt attention listening to everything you're saying when in fact some are some aren't but yeah I think that sort of kind of connection and commitment from the audience really matters I have a friend who's an entertainer and he's been kind of experimenting with these these kind of live events and sort of re releasing some um, music and, and videos online and he recently did an event where um, his name's Tim Arnold if anybody wants to look him up um, he did a event where you know it was a zoom meeting and he had everybody sing a line from the song back to him so he had everybody else mute and then he would sing to them he's like la 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 and then you had to say la you had to read it repeat it back to him la 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 and then he recorded all of those individually and then afterwards edited them all together and then it sounds like a whole chorus of people doing it together and i just thought it was what he was really caught on to is this idea of participation is that if you're participating I, I teach a presentation skills class actually i've done quite a lot of them which is about you know how to present to a group of people and one of my one of my main points is that the audience, the people watching, will remember something that they said much more than they remember anything that you, the presenter, said. So if you can get them to answer questions or you can get them to give their ideas, they'll be engaged and they'll remember that, whereas they'll forget 90% actually of what you said. <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm not saying that vaguely. I'm like, they'll literally forget 90% of what you said. So, But they will remember what they said. And I think that's true. So I think what we need to do with these webinars is just, you know, and, and they have that, they have the breakout rooms, and they have that. So I think the more you can kind of take advantage of those things where people participate, the more you'll get that engagement and sort of paying into it, like you were describing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. It sounds fantastic. I, I love to have an interaction, which is kind of hard to figure out in a, in, a, in a kind of online environment because there's a lot of technical issues. Everyone has a different setup. Every, uh, ev everyone is not forced to participate because you can just push on mute and whatever. And the bigger the crowd and the more anonymity you have, then the, le the harder it is to, to people actually move to do something, at least from my experience. So I really, really like the, the interactivity uh, part. And I feel that that's actually, uh, that's absolutely true. Like, um, I mean, that's one of the things that you should do in learning. And for example, that's what I see, especially for example, if you do something about mindsets, 
You know, if you if you teach someone about uh, how to approach something differently, like it can be a, a, like leadership, communication, a career paths. For example, I'm doing like um, career paths, how to become a technical director, um, but also like how to get the job. And a lot of times I have to fight people's expectations from themselves and people per presumptions of themselves, because actually like 50 percent of the time I have to kind of tell people, First thing you have to 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 make sure is that you feel good enough for this job because it, you can do whatever you want. Okay, we can do update your CV, your showreel, but as long as you feel like you're not good enough to apply for Framestore, MPC, and so on, because you feel like ah, they will probably have the, the this kind of, and I'm here, um, you cannot move them. So, and it doesn't matter if I tell them they're good enough. You're like a little bit maybe because you have a status, so they they, they trust you a little bit. But it matter much much more if they feel it, if they say it, if they kind of apply with this attitude and it's like that. So you kind of have to at least that's what I do logically and and emotionally kind of like bring them to their own assumption of like, okay, from what we just kind of experienced together, I think I'm good enough. I thought it not in the beginning, but now I kind of understand from your perspective and then from my also. And so it, it, it is also part of learning is kind of like to not just throw the information at you, like in the old days, you know, like, uh, like a, a professor standing there for one or two hours, just talking constantly. You can maybe ask a question and then you go away and it doesn't work. And it never worked for me in university. It never worked for me in school. So I think there is also the shift of going into like a different direction of teaching. Welcome to our short mid episode coffee break. If you love the content and would like to have a successful career in the film or games industry yourself, check out my website 21artistshow.com. There you can find helpful articles, masterclasses and coaching opportunities that help dozens of my students to bring their profession to the next level. That's all. Check out 21artistshow.com and share the podcast with cool people you know. Let's continue with the episode. One of the things that we, we also like to do here is to give a little bit of advice. So especially, for example, we were talking about learning and I think we, we had a lot of like elements of like what to focus on. Don't don't just just do like I would say, don't just do it the old way. Just bombard yourself with information and then just just kind of hope that you will learn everything and stuff like that. Um, what, what I would be interested here, because I mean, that's something that you're currently building and you were building for the last years. Let's say I'm I'm working uh, like I was working at Weta. So let's say I want to to enhance the experience for me and others, and I create I want to create like a like an environment where people learn more and stuff like that. And I'm I mean I'm I'm an artist. I'm a TD. I'm not sure like where to start, how to do, how to start. And I mean I can do like like uh, let's meet together and talk about things or something like that. But for for me it's like it would be interesting to say like okay I'm in a company. I want to start something like a learning community. I don't know maybe something like that. So what are the the, the elements that you would say is like should be the first steps that you kind of feel like that will make um, a good success and are easy to implement for for even like a, a, like a person who just wants to create that themselves and maybe in the future get support by the company, you know, kind of this baby steps approach. So is there something where you feel like that could be like the first steps you could do for uh, to integrate that for your, your surroundings? Yeah, so kind of for the first steps of creating sort of training, especially if it's not part of a formal thing. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is something that happened by itself. I can't take any credit for it. And it was it's something we call Tech Talks. And it's pretty much just around our software and R&D and the kind of those related teams is they have a weekly session um, considered very informal, don't have to over prepare where someone gets in front of the group and does a tech talk on what they're specifically working on or what they're interested in. And they, they really took pains to kind of say, look, we won't even record this if you don't want to record it. There's no pressure. We're not expecting you to have perfect slides. The idea is it's casual, low stress, low, you know, low intensity, and you just tell us what you're up to uh, and present in front of the group. And so that started on its own and it's kind of grown to be something which then they said, hey, Andrew, can you help run this? So now I'm getting involved, which is great. And so it's really nice when stuff does grow organically from within rather than kind of being put 
down on top of people. So I think um, another piece of advice I think is so important is that it's as important to know what information you want to deliver as it is to know your audience. Who are they? Where do they, you know, any training, I, I, I've kind of boiled it down to a equation which I call A plus B equals C. So A is the learner and where they are now. C is the de desired outcome and B is the training you want to add. So for this to work, it's really good if you have a pretty good idea of two of those, <laughs> you know, because what can be missed often is someone might deliver an amazing training, but if it's for the wrong audience, it's actually useless to them. So knowing your audience, know where they're starting from, knowing where you want to get them to, I think is, is such a key variable in this because uh, if you don't know that, you'll miss completely. So as much as you should prepare your topic, you should understand your audience. I really like that idea. I think that's that sounds like a, a low maintenance uh, kind of start where you just basically create like a group. You have a, you should have like a specific like topic like tech talks or future talks or artistic talks. I think that's super important. Shouldn't be like let's meet together and everyone presents something kind of like I think it's always kind of good to create like like I wouldn't say call it rules but guidelines or something so this is this about and worst case you can create multiple ones if you feel like there's groups but I think that's that's a that's a actually a great start and that that's something I, I actually did before where I was like uh, teaching Python to the the uh, the artists mostly, and uh, what I was the only thing I did it was ask the company for example, hey, can I have a room or something like that? And then you can always see how they pick it up or not. I mean, best case they will start to like that's great. Um, we maybe support you with like an hour. You know, you you get an hour of actual work time for you and the and the kind of participants and you can teach them so it's not just like on the after hours or like worst case let's say it this way like you get maybe a room because if there's room available they give you a room and then you you have an environment where you can say like okay at 6 p.m. or something like that um whoever wants to learn some python skills come come to to the thing so i think that's that's this kind of like it's like the self impulse and the self interest basically and then um like let the company know and try to find out how much they kind of already jump on it but especially if you do it for a while a lot of times i feel like uh every every company that has some sense will kind of like okay we want to support that because it feels like there's something but i think it's, it is important to have like a proof you know like i think that's something you should not ex always generally i think it's life advice don't just expect uh, from like, oh, I want education. Oh, I, w I want this and this because I saw it at Framestore, I ILM, at Weta. I want that in my company too. I think the big best way is just start it yourself, what you like. You know, there's this brain trust and Pixar and whatever. If you like something like that, just try to start it yourself, uh, inform, inform the company and then see where it rolls, basically, I would say. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. And I also think that, you know, people often say, oh, there's no time, there's no budget, there's no, and I'm like, well, there's a lot you can do. In fact, this whole FTV thing I mentioned was like, we basically didn't have a budget. You know, we paid for the webinar Zoom account and then everything else, I had no budget, literally zero. And we provided a lot of content. Or, you know, you think of something like a figure drawing class, how, um, how much does it cost to bring like a figure model in for a couple hours, you know, in an evening once a week? It really, then we're not talking about a lot of money here. You can do a lot of stuff very inexpensively, getting internal people to give talks. Like it's just, it's about will. One of the things I did, and I'm pretty proud of at Framestore, and, and I continue to work towards at all the other studios, is to have a dedicated training room. And the idea is to make it as easy as possible uh, for people to provide training, for people to record training, and for people to share training. So in this training room, you know, you go in and at the instructor station, there's a little touchpad, and to record your training is literally one tap. You just hit the record button, audio's perfect, screen record perfect every single time. And 
that was always such a nightmare getting like the screen recording up and running and making sure the audio yeah. was what I was and things were lost. And so we've just, we made that as simple as literally as simple as possible. And it has a lot of good tricks. You can show the whiteboard, you can do picture in picture, you can, you can mess with it and do some cool stuff. But fundamentally, if you walk in there and hit the red button, your thing's recorded. So, but it's also because it's a dedicated room, you're not fighting with, for example, a meeting room or a, 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 a review suite or screening room, which are often really heavily booked. And certainly at Framestore, our review suites, is like try to get an hour in there, you know? And if you do get an hour in there for training, someone said, sorry, client call, you're bumped. You know what I mean? So having a dedicated space, and I know every company can't provide that, you know, so it has to do with Framestore being large that we were even able to do that. but. That's something I'm really passionate about. And we've built one in Montreal. We're opening up a Mumbai studio and we're building one there. And what we're setting it as a priority for these studios is to have this dedicated space. And I, I can't, you know, I can't emphasize that enough that it's just that the space itself matters. You know, having a dedicated space and having dedicated gear to training is going to make it so that when someone does have the idea of the Python class or the Tech Talks, it's easy to do. Oh, yeah, just book this space. You're ready to go. Everything's set up, you know. So because I, my whole thing, back to the idea of everybody is a student and everybody is a teacher, to actually live that, it needs to be easy and convenient. So I, I see myself as not kind of creating all the learning myself. It's more about facilitating everybody else to do it. What I like about this, this, this specific room, for example, it actually follows the idea of uh, like removing barriers. That's, that's the main idea. I mean, it's, it could be like a room, it could be uh, like a software already installed and just clickable on your computer uh, or something like that. Something that you basically make people like say, okay, I want to do it. It's super easy to do and I know how. You know, it's not, I don't have to search uh, if there is a program on my computer to do something maybe or like uh, go to find a room where I can do that. So I think the barrier thing is actually one of the, the most important thing is like, Remove the barriers so people can uh, like create something in if they feel like that would like help um, in a way. And personally, I, I really uh, feel like something is like in terms of documentation. You know, we have we have a lot of software, self-made software, um, self-made workflows. I think that's something a little bit overlooked at the moment. A lot of times is to create tutorials instead of like having a like a long-winded tutorial page which is often badly written badly pictured um and also not not uh, recent you know like five ten years before written written and no one like maintained it because sometimes you don't even find it um i feel like like a, a quick tutorial which is which is where something someone takes a little bit of effort um, can go a long mile of exp especially explaining workflows, you know, like how to publish something, how to use a specific workflow. It's 10 million times better if someone just shows it, clicks the thing, it shows an example, than having like a long winded like list of things or maybe even just full blown text, basically. So I think I think it's a it's a really really nice idea. By the way, I also solved your equation. So a, a plus b equals c is like b equals c minus a is the is how you can <laughs> how you basically uh, solve that one. Uh, it is it is in the end of the day is like what is necessary to achieve the goal. You're there. Uh, that is missing, and uh, what do you need to what you actually want? But it also means you need to know what you want, and that's also sometimes a thing that. Um, needs to be defined uh, and maybe helped with sometimes with the people because also like um, education and learning is cool but I think sometimes it's also important to give the people the chance like artists and develop, like uh, talk about careers maybe talk about the, 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 so they know what to learn and where to go because sometimes you get a little bit stuck like mentally or uh, like and then you're like I continue this and after like a half a year you are so in the workflow that you're kind of like don't see the, the the tree from the forest anymore. And sometimes I feel as much as learning also, I feel like there's there's always a good way of, besides inspiration, I think that's something that you always kind of try to do by showing new things, you know, fabric and stuff like that. I think it's always good to, to have like a little bit of element of um, helping people to find goals also, you know, um, and having a, a, like giving them the opportunity to talk about their goals so they can kind of, crystallize ideas and paths for themselves. Because if you don't have a path, you don't know what to do, basically. I'm surrounded by just absolutely brilliant people and who every single one of them 
is better than me at what they do, you know? But it's interesting sometimes when they come to me to talk about training, things that, you know, seem very common sense to me are, can be like a revelation. They're like, yeah, well, I want to deliver this training on this. I'm like, well, okay, well, why don't we start with an outline of the main, and they're like, ah, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, like, <laughs> like some things that seem obvious or that A plus B equals C. It's like, okay, well, we think we want to do a training on this. So it's like, okay, well, what would you like people to be able to do by the end of the training? Like, what's the outcome? What's the learning goal? And they're like, oh, uh, you know, it's like suddenly it's, it's, it's just having the conversation with people. It's just getting getting them to break it down and think of it. And they're they're like already ninety percent there, but just having that interaction, who someone's kind of stepped back a little bit and kind of thinking more broadly, is interestingly really helps people out more than one would think. Because some of this stuff just might seem like common sense, but maybe it just seems like common sense because I'm doing it all day every day. Yeah, and I think that's that's a, that's what basically what it boils down. I think um, it's it's great to find all the techniques we were talking about, like uh, remove barriers, um, create a space, uh, create uh, like like multiple ways of like on off. You know, not just kind of tutorials, but sometimes hands on and stuff like that. So basically all this element, but it is as important to to give a little bit of perspective, to give an outline, to remind people of goals, because sometimes you kind of like so much in the on the rails already that you maybe see that you want to achieve this skill but after a while you actually um, lose the feeling of why you actually want to do that like why do you want to become a lead or why do you want to learn this perfection or something and then sometimes you can you can like lose the interest but you're still going because you don't think about the as you basically said the outline and the bigger picture you just see what's in front of you so you continue going that path and that's neither healthy not like not also but also not good in terms of learning and growing one of the things i like to talk about is the approach to learning and i really encourage a, a playful approach i think students sometimes you know they'll open a, a software like maya and they'll be given instructions and it all seems very complicated and it all seems you know you have to do everything just right and just the right order to get anything to work and, and then they get sort of scared and they don't want to touch something because they might break it. And the approach I really encourage, whether it's for software or fine arts or anything else, is this sort of playful approach where it's like, just play with it, just break it, you know? They said, turn it up to 10. What happens if I turn it up to 100? What happens if I turn it up to 10,000? And just play with everything and break everything and goof around and, do things that aren't focused on the outcome. And I think this is true whether it's fine art or technical learning or anything in between, that when you're in the process, when you're not thinking about the outcome and you're just focused on the process, is actually where you get the best outcome. And the example I like to give is actually figure drawing. If you're sitting there doing a figure drawing and you're like, I really want this to turn off to be good. I really want this drawing to be great. I want it never turns out good. But if when you're just there in the moment and just kind of like, oh, look at the way the shoulder kind of comes in this way. And then, oh, I can kind of see how the light's doing that. You know, when you're just in it, then you get good results. So it's this whole idea about process versus product. And training kind of lives in the world of process. And I actually think there's been kind of a shift globally to people really liking process and wanting to see process. It's like people just people who have never work in the industry like watching those visual effects breakdown reels, for example. Or I think like my Instagram feed is basically full of seeing how people do drawings or see, seeing how people do other techniques. And yes, I like to see the product at the end, but it's the process itself. And, and I think everybody's more interested in process now than just product. And that goes for even in the final entertainment, they kind of want to see how it came together. What's the, how is it made? What's the backstory? It's all part of it and, and it, it enriches it rather than, I mean, I think there was this, there's used to be like this kind of idea, like this kind of movie magic sort of wall. And it's like, if you <laughs> penetrated that, you're ruining Pixar the button. magic. There was always this Pixar button everywhere, yeah. you know, like, uh, I'll just press the Pixar button, everything looks great. Yeah. But there, but there was this idea that, well, if we show them our tricks, it ruins the suspension of disbelief. 
And I, you know, there's something to that, but there's also something to people just feeling more involved when they understand the process. And I think that that kind of, you know, living in that space, that space of process is where training lives and kind of, and, and loving the process. And, and, you know, it just kind of reminds me of what very earlier in my career, when I was sort of getting individual effects um, and people talking about the films they work on. And they said, I remember someone saying, you know, most of the movies we work on are bad. <laughs> like they're <laughs> dumb movies, you know, especially if you think of, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, visual effects movies. I don't know. I mean, even today, there's plenty of, there's plenty of bad movies being made that are very expensive with very expensive visual effects. Um, and so they're like, it's not necessary. They said that maybe you only get to work on one film in your whole career that you absolutely love. Or maybe it's one out of five or one. Who knows? You have to love the process, you know, to be in this. You have to love the art and you have to love the process because you're not always going to love the product. Yeah. And actually, from my experience, the better the product, like the better the product in, in quotation, um, the worse is the process. Because there's a lot of uh, expectation, there is a lot of pressure. You know, if you if you work on the highest budget project ever, and there is like like a lot of pressure to perform. You know, maybe also from your inside also. But then then the the process is so stressful that uh, you ha mostly have more freedom on the B movies actually more or less because no one kind of cares in a lot of sense. And then there is something where where you can experiment more because there is less expectation and because there's sometimes a lot more freedom because like who cares more or less you know um, of course the budget is smaller but also the team is smaller so it kind of weighs its other out so i think it's a it's a it's an important thing to um the, the what you basically said about the process i mean but it's hard to you know if you live it you live your life you're doing your work to kind of remind yourself is like yeah 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 like keep it cool uh, don't stress yourself about this kind of stuff you know it's it's always kind of much harder to to do but but what i think what motivates me a little bit for example uh, this podcast is also part of that is to the if you if you have stress with something um the only way to get away from the stress is basically to get so much experience that you're like doing it like like breathing You know, like the same thing, like the first episode, I was stumbling upon my words. Second episode, I was trying to to be more conscious that I'm speaking slower so I don't have this uh, less. And and now I'm I'm starting to think less and less. You know, I'm, I'm starting to really, really listen and try to kind of create a conversation. Uh, I still have like you, basically, we have all these technical things we have to be aware of. We have all these things. But... I lose myself that. And the only reason that I'm doing that is because I'm doing that now for, for like X episodes. I'm doing coaching everywhere. I'm doing masterclasses everywhere. And so through the process, I basically uh, become more stress-free in a way and I can and still perform better. So it's a both sided thing. So I feel like this is, this is something that would motivate me is like, okay, start with crappy. Start with crappy, go with crappy, and then through the process, you will get better automatically. You will get less stressed and you will perform better. You know, so it's like a win, win, win. You just have to um, to kind of spend the time. That's why I feel like the 10,000 hour rule is still good. I mean, it is basically if you want to do a good online course or something, you probably have to be like a teacher in some capacity before for like years. You know, if you want to become a good artist, it's probably the same thing. You know, it's not like just you, you, you learn modeling for a year and then you become like hired by ILM and stuff like that. It, it is the thing. And then when you are hired, you're already so good. You're like, okay, I can focus now on other things than, than like if I'm good or not. Yeah, I've really liked um, connecting people working, digital natives who currently are working in visual effects to the history of special effects and where everything's done practically. And my good friend Valerie Charlton has done a few talks. She worked on all the Monty Python films and the Terry Gilliam films and did all these practical special effects. And what she described and where I see the link with what we do now is that in every project, you had to find the sort of internal logic of that specific task where whatever you're creating, you have to find this. Again, we're talking about process, this internal process. Um, so that was the connection between the two. And I think it's something anybody working on a computer can really relate to because you find something, you, you have to do this and this and this and this, and then you get kind of faster at doing that. 
and then you kind of form this pattern and then maybe you can even automate it and you know and then and then turn it into a process and i think but the same thing is when you're building a miniature or you're creating a prop or you're creating effect it's that same finding the internal logic and process yeah i think i can totally relate to that i mean it's a technical thing too and because for a lot of times people nowadays they know like to press the button and then the 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 happens uh, but sometimes they don't know what it actually means. And this creates this thing of like, oh, I know how to do it in Maya, but I don't understand the process. So I don't even know how it is in Houdini. And I mean, that's the better skill. It's like, maybe I'm not as good in Maya and not as good as in Houdini, but I know the process. So if if necessary, I find it out in, in some hours and then I can do it in both. You know, I think that's a little bit, and that's something that we lost a little bit nowadays. You know, you don't even know how to build your computer anymore. I did that. Um, uh, it's it's still something I can do. I'm not afraid of that. Um, but I know a lot of people nowadays, like, I don't know, I just bought it. And if it's broken, I throw it away um, kind of mentality. So I, I feel I like that. And I think that's a, that's a really, actually a really, really good idea to to integrate that into our new into our new way of, of approaching and still looking under the hood, not just kind of, I know how to do it because I watched a video and they clicked through that. And that's what I learned actually, basically, you know, no, I really love that. So um, a final question before we go into our 10 seconds question around, you know, where we just uh, basically go through like very quickly, but a final question to kind of like summarize that or um, is, what would you say is your vision or your goal for the future of, of like like education learning or maybe even even a little bit in a different direction? What you feel is like something that you would like to approach in the future that you feel like is 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 actually the VR, the machine learning or whatever in, in terms of learning and developing like people's skills? The big trend that I keep seeing is that the tools are becoming more like artists' tools. Like, I love Maya. I've been using it since its original release. I actually wrote a book on one of the early versions. Like, I, I, like, I know it, and I have this kind of like innate knowledge of every little broken thing in there. But using it doesn't, it doesn't feel like an artist tool. It, do, it doesn't feel, it feels more like, I don't know, an engineering or an architecture tool. Lately, I've been playing with um, Procreate on the iPad. And it just feels like an artist tool. It's this intuitive, very fluid thing. I think ZBrush is a little bit like that. I think, you know, um, Unreal Engine feels, you know, for creating environments feels more like an artist tool. I feel like um, some of the new things I've been playing with on the, the VR content creation tools like Masterpiece VR and um, some of those other ones have a feel of an artist tool where you're, you're physically moving your body to create things. You're moving around a physical space rather than just staring at a rectangle the whole time. And I think that what I see a trend towards is moving towards where the, that it feels like an artist tool and that the important skills are, are the art skills, the telling a story, telling a visual story, creating characters, those kinds of things are going to be more important than, um, you know, knowing all the little tricks within Maya. What would you say is like something um, that someone could pick up at the moment very specific that would be like super, super interesting and maybe give you a heads up. I think that's always kind of, I think that's always like a, like a favorite question of everyone. Like, how can I work there? Can you give me a tip? Do you have like something that you feel like you, you just noticed a, a trend at the moment that you can like, Hey, just learn that. That will be a, a good, a safe bet to have a, a, an edge. Couple answers to the question. The sort of obvious answer to what's the hot new thing to learn is it's Unreal Engine. You know, we currently have a big project, which I mentioned before, called Fuse Framestore Unreal Shot Engine to incorporate that into our pipeline. You have all the excitement about LED wall virtual production. But I caution people against kind of hopping onto a trend and thinking that's what's going to do it for them because it all comes back to the fundamentals. You know, I think of our frame store pre-production services who do pre-vis and post-vis work and those kinds of things, and they use Unreal Engine, but it's not their knowledge of the Unreal Engine itself that makes them valuable. It's, it's how do you tell a story? How do you use a camera to tell a story? Understanding the history of film. Like, I don't think there's an easy, quick fix or a shortcut. I think it's about loving this craft, loving the art form, 
steeping yourself in all aspects of it, and then applying that to the latest tools that's gonna to carry you through. I don't think any kind of, oh, if I learn this one thing, I'll get a job. I just, I, I, just, I caution against that approach a little bit. That said, yeah, learn on real, it's great fun, and it's like a hot thing right now. So, you know, I, I, I kind of cons I sit on both sides of that fence, but I, I caution against th thinking people, that, people thinking there's a silver bullet that's gonna get them in. Yeah, I was just thinking of the 90% thing that you just mentioned in the beginning is like, I'm pretty sure uh, from most of what you just said was just Unreal. <laughs> uh, that was like, like Unreal Engine, that was the answer. Let's move on about the rest. Like, no, but I absolutely agree. I mean, it, it basically aligns with what we talked about. You know, uh, fundamentals are always more important. But in the end of the day, if you, if you don't know what fundamentals are or, or need a little bit of a guideline, I think this kind of also helps a lot to give a little bit of this learn Unreal, learn USD, learn something, because it is something where people like get an edge a little bit compared to someone what is. That's that's fantastic. And I think it's also like a fantastic summary. And then we have like a, like a new segment that came a little bit. It's kind of like a 10 seconds question. So basically I just give you like a quick question and like if you, if you can answer it in around 10 seconds, it's just so, something very, very short. I think that's always a great like ending section, section and gives you a little bit like, oh, a little bit of, of about you, it's more like that. So uh, biggest inspiration, living dead or fictional? Um, I guess I would have to say films, you know, and I think, you know, what first thing that came to mind is the films of Terry Gilliam. Would you do anything differently? <laughs> would I do anything differently? I actually like to think I would do everything differently because I'm an experience <laughs> junkie and I want to have all new experiences. <laughs> But is there something specific that you would say, okay, if I, if I could revert, revert the time, that's something I would like to, you know, would make my life much easier nowadays? Yeah, I just, I think, you know, I, I guess what I would say is that always follow your goal. Set a goal that's really, really high, and then every decision you make should point towards that goal. When you have a fork in the road, you can either go towards that goal or away from it. Always take the one that's towards that goal. One thing you cannot live without. One thing I cannot live without, nature. What's your hidden talent? Hidden talent. Um, I, um, my hidden talent is I always see the best in people. And final question, uh, how far would you get and who wants to be a millionaire? How far would I get and who wants to be a millionaire? Probably halfway. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more, more than I would. Yeah, I probably would fail on the second question or something like that. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for sharing with you our, your insights and about learning how to grow into the future. I really, really appreciate for you taking the time. It was amazing to have you here on the show. That's it with this week's episode of the 21 Artist Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This podcast is 100% ad free. And to keep it that way, check out my website, 21artistshow.com. There you can find exclusive access to awesome masterclasses and coaching opportunities to work successfully in visual effects, animation, and games. Just go to 21artistshow.com. And don't forget to share it with people who would benefit from that content and tell them they're awesome. See you on the next episode. Next on the 21 Art Show. We're sitting at a table. Uh, this is an event uh, at dinner. And this girl came by who's a matte painter. And she's like, hey, do you mind if I just sit down for a second and show you my portfolio? And um, we're like, yeah, sure. Show us your stuff. And we're looking through it. And it's good work. And out of nowhere, she starts crying. And we're like, why are you crying? Like, what's going on? And she's saying, I'm 23 and I haven't made it yet. And there's like all this invisible pressure that we put on ourselves where at 23, most people shouldn't even, you know, have their first job necessarily. And he or she is thinking she's a failure because she's put that invisible pressure on herself. And I think again, that a lot of us have that unrealistic, unrealistic expectation because they go out of their way to compare themselves to someone who has been the industry for 10, 20 years, and they think, well, I'm not at that level yet. I haven't achieved all this yet, even though they're on the first year.